<sighs> Something you may want to look again, look at again in later years. Depends how it goes. <laughs> Hi, Dan. Good. Good morning. Recording in progress. We're only missing one committee member, and it's not even nine o'clock. So, which one? Ross. Okay. <laughs> There he is. Nice, impressive. We have, we have met the first challenge of the morning. Everyone who has to be here is here. And we can give a couple more minutes for people who wish to be here, which, uh, but do not have to be here uh, to join us. Looks like the crowd is piling in. Hey. <laughs> what do we think? One more minute? Does that work for you, Taya? Sure. Okay. All right, well, why don't we get started, especially since I'm going to make everyone suffer through a minute or two of introductory remarks for me anyway, before we hand it over to the call for the pre kickoff. Uh, one of the service team members noted that uh, okay, special thanks. attention had been given to dependencies, and the date on the monkey tester uh, for yeah. the report that <laughs> I looked at was 10 days before the start of the I'm process. Not host, so so it's possible that this is an artifact of a problem that's already been solved. So if you make me co host, I may be able to meet people. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Uh, is info the correct severity for that one, or would you like it bumped up to? There we go. Much easier. Uh, all right, we'll try this again. Uh, so first of all, uh, so welcome uh, to Talia's defense. Uh, everyone is welcome and welcome to participate. Uh, the committee members here, myself as her advisor, and Zach and Roz and Max. Uh, and just a bit of uh, logistics. Um, you know, Talia has about 40 minutes worth of presentation, but people can politely or courteously, if you will, interrupt as we go with questions or concerns. Um, Talia's asked me to manage traffic a little bit. I'll be watching for sort of the raised hand, or you can put something in the chat, or, you know, if there's a reasonable pause, you're welcome to sort of unmute as though we were all in a conference room together. Uh, for better or for worse, we're all fairly Zoom savvy at this point. Uh, and, you know, we can always make logistical course corrections as we go if needed. Um, 
After the presentation, there'll be time for more questions and discussion. After that, we'll have everyone accept the committee leave, or if there are any other UW faculty here, which I don't actually see at the moment, they are welcome to stay, but don't have to. Uh, then, uh, then one more stage exists where we have Talia leave, um, and then and then after that, uh, we we find a way to get Talia to come back, and then and then we're done. So that's the the order of events. Um, you'll have to suffer with me telling you um, the story of how Talia and I met, uh, which is you know, in, in, an intimidating story to tell because I see we have some people here who've known Talia much longer than me. In fact, the people who were the first people on the planet to ever meet Talia <laughs> are here. So I, I can't compete with that. But I can tell you that um, she crashed PLDI 2013 um, at the advice of her mentor, Jeff Foster. Um, uh, for, for kind of the stated purpose to meet me and others because she, she might want to go to grad school. Um, and sort of, you know, here we are just about eight years later. And, and I'll tell one quirk to this story is that um, someone else who was at that conference, uh, Roz, apologies, I don't know if you were there or not, but I know Zach was. And, and I remember uh, because um, we had just hired Zach. He hadn't even started at UW yet. And so um, the previous time I had seen Zach was at his interview in a suit, but then at the conference, he was back to t-shirt and sandals as you would expect from a UC San Diego grad student. So at this point, basically the only two things that I remember from this conference is meeting Talia, who ended up coming to grad school at UW and working with us for several years and Zach wearing t-shirt and sandals. Um, but back to Talia, uh, so she came to UW, uh, what, two-ish years later, year and a half later, the rest is sort of history. Uh, you know, um, she actually started working on some other things. She's got this security paper that we did with a junior colleague in security. She had some nice work on automated testing and an Amazon internship, but she really became enamored with proof engineering. I dare say she wrote the book on it along with colleagues. There's now this survey paper on what proof engineering is and why the computer science community should care. And within that, she's made her own ad, uh, advances on, on proof repair. And I won't say more about that because given that it's the, the title of essentially her dissertation or presentation today, I'll have her uh, tell you what that's all about. Take it away, Talia. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for coming to my defense. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about my work on proof repair. Uh, so proof repair is a part of proof engineering, or the technologies that make it easier to develop and maintain verified systems. What I mean by verified systems here are systems that are proven correct using these tools called proof assistants. So to use a proof assistant, you write your program inside of the proof assistant, uh, but then you can also specify what you want to prove about your program, and then write a proof that shows your program satisfies your specification, so it does what you said it does. Proof assistant will check this and let you know if your proof is correct, so your program is verified. Uh, now these proof assistants have come a long way since they first came out, especially when it comes to this first step here of actually, or this last step here of actually writing this proof. This used to be so hard that even experts would mostly verify only toy programs, but it's gotten much easier. And so in the last couple of decades, proof engineers have used these proof assistants to verify all sorts of large and critical systems. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this um, is actually a verified operating system microkernel inside of an autonomous helicopter. Uh, so this operating system microkernel, Cell4, was proven secure and used to make this helicopter resilient to hacking. That is, before Cell4, DARPA, DARPA hired a team of professional hackers to try to hijack this helicopter, send it commands remotely, and they succeeded. Uh, but then after building in Cell4, they had these hackers try again, and this time they could not hijack the helicopter. So this is a real example of verified software in the real world. But this wasn't the effort of a single proof engineer. This was the effort of a team of proof engineers spending more than 20 person years and more than a million lines of proof. So that verification at this scale is even possible is thanks to developments in proof engineering. Uh, and proof engineering, though it's a relatively new uh, term, is not a new concept. So uh, for example, when I wrote this, uh, this book on the survey paper on proof engineering uh, with my colleagues, uh, this is actually more than 120 pages long, not including citations. So there's a lot of work in this space. But one thing that I realized as I was writing this is that most of the work so far has focused on how to develop these systems to begin with. And there's really not that much on how to maintain them. Uh, how do you keep your proofs up to date as the system themselves change over time? Uh, so 
this is the focus of my thesis work on proof repair. Uh, proof repair makes it easier to maintain these verified systems. Uh, and this is important because this is really hard. Uh, you know, even if you verified a large system, at some point you might go back and change your program or change your specification. And either of these things can break your proofs. At that point, there isn't really a way to ask the proof assistant for help in fixing your proof. Uh, so this remains so hard that right now, even experts will sometimes just give up in the face of change, which is a huge problem. Uh, and this has actually been a problem since at least 1977. Uh, when three really famous researchers wrote this famous critique of verification called social processes. Uh, and in it, they basically argued, you know, we just should not try to verify software at all. Uh, so surprisingly, I've actually found this to be a big source of inspiration for my thesis work. So I want to share a two part quote from that paper uh, that has really, you know, inspired a lot of this work. Uh, so in the first part of the quote, they said a sufficiently fanatical researcher might be willing to devote two or three years to verifying a significant piece of software if you could be assured that the software would remain stable. Uh, and I think judging by the scale of software we've seen verified in recent years, um, either this has gotten much easier or researchers have gotten much more fanatical. Uh, but, you know, they went on and they said, real life programs need to be maintained and modified. Uh, and then they said something that really inspired this thesis work. Uh, they said, there's no reason to believe that verifying a modified program is any easier than verifying the original the first time around. Uh, and, you know, I used to agree with this, uh, but I don't anymore, because my thesis work will show that there's often reason to believe verifying a modified program can and should be easier than verifying the original the first time around in practical use cases. Or more formally, that uh, changes in program specifications and proofs can all carry information that a tool can go in and extract, generalize, and apply to fix other proofs broken by the same changes. And furthermore, a tool that automates this can save work for proof engineers relative to reference manual repairs in practical use cases. Uh, so these tools are called proof repair tools, and I'll show you how they work later on, uh, plus two different kinds of proof repair that I've implemented. Uh, but before I get there, I want to motivate the problem a little bit more uh, by showing you what it's like to develop and maintain one of these systems to begin with. Uh, so I'll start by showing you what it's like to develop one of these systems. Uh, now, the verified system that I show you here uh, is not going to be an operating system microkernel. Uh, instead, I'm going to start by just showing you uh, that the list zip function preserves its length. Uh, and this is a bit of a toy example, uh, but larger verified systems are often composed of lots of these small examples kind of built on top of each other. Uh, the proof assistant that I show you this in will be the proof assistant called COC, uh, because this is the proof assistant that my thesis work focuses on. Uh, when COC is built on this beautiful functional programming language called Galena. Uh, and Galena implements this rich type theory called the calculus of inductive constructions. It's okay if you don't know that much about that. Uh, you can essentially think of it as like the lambda calculus, so a simple functional programming language uh, with some additional features, which I'll show you really soon, uh, that make it possible to actually you know, write proofs about your programs. Uh, so if you'd like, you can actually write their program, your specification, and your proof inside of Galena. Uh, so, you know, let's start by verifying this program. Uh, the first thing that we need is our list data type, which is actually inside of the Cox Standard Library. Uh, and this already shows off two of the features, uh, polymorphism and induction. Uh, so a list is polymorphic over some type T. You can have a list of numbers, a list of characters, and it's defined inductively by its two constructors, nil and cons. Uh, that is, either a list is nil or empty, uh, or it's the result of taking some element and some other list and sticking the element in front of or consing it onto the rest of the list. Uh, so that's our list data type. Uh, now, once we have that list data type, we can write functions about it, uh, like our zip function. Uh, so our zip function is going to take two lists of possibly different types as input, a list of A's, a list of B's, and return a list of pairs A, B. Uh, so for example, if our input lists are one, two, three, four, and X, Y, Z, uh, then zip will return one X, two Y, three Z. Uh, now, it's worth noting that the zip function has to make some decision with what to do with this extra four at the end. You know, what does it do when these uh, input lists are different lengths? And the decision that this zip function makes is to just ignore those extra elements. Uh, but otherwise, the implementation is fairly standard. Uh, if either list is empty, it just returns the empty list. And otherwise, it takes the first element of each list, combines them into a pair, and then conses that onto the result of recursively calling zip on the rest of each list. So that's our zip function. Uh, once we have that, we can then specify the thing we want to prove. 
that zip preserves its length. Uh, and this is where this last feature, these dependent types, uh, first come in. Dependent types actually let us quantify over all possible input terms. So we can write a specification, a theorem here, that zip preserves its length. That says for all possible inputs, L1 and L2, all possible lists here, uh, if the lengths of these inputs are the same, then the length of the output is the same as the length of the input. Uh, so this is the theorem that we state. Uh, and this is actually a type inside of Galena. Uh, but you know, choosing this theorem here that we're going to prove, this part is a bit of an art. Uh, so it's worth noting that you know, we could have just as well chosen this definition of zip preserves length. Uh, this is also true. Uh, and in fact, it's stronger. It implies the other definition of zip preserves length. But regardless of which one we choose here, what will happen next is that Koch will send this back to us as the goal we need to prove. In particular, it'll say, OK, construct a function with that type. Uh, and then we get to the process of actually writing this proof, which is constructing that function. Uh, and this is maybe the weirdest part, because while in principle, we could write that proof all in one go as a giant function inside of Galena, this thing called a proof term, uh, in practice, this turns out to be pretty hard. So instead, proof engineers typically write proofs interactively uh, using this language called LTAC, uh, this thing called a proof script. And this language gives them a lot of abstraction. Uh, and this language LTAC uses something called proof automation. Uh, this is a bit of a misnomer because again, it's more like an interactive or assisted process, which is why they call these proof assistants. Uh, so what happens is after Cox sends us back this goal type, uh, you know, then we actually drop into this interactive proof mode. And in this interactive proof mode, we send Cox these sort of high level strategies called tactics, like do induction. Uh, Cock will then respond to those tactics by refining our goal to some sub goal, like, OK, prove the base case. Uh, we'll respond with more tactics, like, OK, the base case holds by reflexivity. Cock will respond with another sub goal, like, OK, solve the next case. And this whole process of tactics and these sub goal types will continue and continue, all the while we're building up this thing called a proof script. And this is the high level proof inside of this language of tactics, LTAC. But it continues until Cock is able to find a proof. And what that really means is that Koch is able to compile this proof script down into a low-level proof term, that function in Galena that we could have just written ourselves to begin with if we had enough patience. Uh, the advantage of this being that Koch can check this really easily, make sure it's correct. In fact, all it has to do is type check it and make sure it has the type that we set out to prove to begin with. And then it can let us know with certainty that we've you know, proven this successfully. Uh, but we never have to think about these low-level proof terms we get to write these high level abstract proof scripts. Uh, so in case you're curious, uh, this is what it looks like with actual tactics and terms. Um, it's, it might be a little bit overwhelming. I've just highlighted uh, corresponding tactics and the terms that they compiled down to inside of Galena. Um, I'll show you one example. Uh, so when I call this induction tactic, uh, what happens here is I'm inducting over the input list L2. Uh, Cock will compile this down to this thing called an induction principle. And this is basically just a special function uh, that lets me prove things about any possible list. Uh, and to do that, I break it into cases. So I prove a base case and I prove an inductive case. Uh, so that's what like a basic uh, inductive proof kind of looks like. Uh, but you know, this is what it's like to develop one of these systems uh, using Galena and LTAC, this proof automation uh, to begin with. Uh, and, and this proof automation is really great when it comes to developing these systems. Uh, but it turns out that it's a bit naive when it comes to maintaining them. Uh, so what I mean by maintaining uh, these verified systems is at some point you might change your program or specification. And either of these things can break your proofs. Uh, so for example, you know, earlier we picked this definition of zip preserves length. Uh, let's say at some point we want to move to the stronger version. We can do that. Uh, but if we have proofs that used zip preserves length, uh, those proofs might break in response to the change. And then we have to go in and fix them. Uh, now, if we have enough foresight, there are things we can do ahead of time uh, to make these proofs less likely to break uh, when something changes. Uh, one example of this that I like is rather than use a sort of low-level tactic like reflexivity, uh, we can write our own really powerful custom tactics. These things might be less likely to break. Uh, and furthermore, uh, when they do break, the burden of fixing our proof might come down to just fixing the implementation of this tactic instead of every single place where it's used. Uh, so this approach is advocated for in a famous book on proof engineering or on uh, verification, and it's one that I really like. Uh, now, there are a number of other uh, development processes that we could also use 
uh, that sort of mirror traditional software engineering development processes a little bit more, uh, but still with some extra steps to deal with the challenges of writing proofs. But even with these you know, design principles out there, uh, even experts will sometimes just give up in the face of change. Uh, so I saw this when I did a user study of proof engineers. What I did in this user study was actually instrument cock uh, in a totally non-invasive way. Uh, and then I had uh, eight proof engineers opt in uh, to use this instrumented version of cock uh, as they went about their normal proof development for a course of a month. Uh, I looked at every change they made, every fix they made, uh, and I found that changes like this were really common. Uh, so one expert user changed a number of specifications uh, in fairly standard, like fairly standard repetitive ways. Uh, and this actually did break his proofs. Uh, you know, before this change, he had this long proof of one of his theorems, uh, which succeeded. Uh, and then after that, he actually just gave up, which is why you see this abort. Uh, so, you know, again, we have experts just giving up in the face of change. Uh, and this is a really big problem when it comes to verifying big systems, because while for small systems, this problem might be pretty confined. So even if you have to fix your proofs, you might just have to fix a couple of them in one location. A big system might look more like this, where you have a library at top and a whole bunch of clients that depend on it. And even though the details of the program of the specification in the library typically are abstracted away from all these clients, uh, at some point you might change your library specification, and this can break all these client proofs. Uh, so at that point, it's not even you changing your program or specification, it's someone else. Uh, and this happens even with things like the Cox standard library. Uh, so, you know, I suppose we could ask ourselves at this point, you know, maybe experts then are just bad at design. Maybe they should just use these design principles uh, much better. Uh, or, you know, maybe the social processes people were right, and maybe we just shouldn't verify programs at all. Uh, but I think the better answer is just that even experts are human. Uh, so well in principle, with perfect foresight, they could pick perfect abstractions, perfect tactics that never break in response to change. In practice, that's not quite how things work. Uh, they might write tactics that refer to the names of variables or to the names of other theorems, other lemmas that might change. Uh, or they might pick an abstraction, but that abstraction might not be what they want after the change, or they might put the wrong thing behind that abstraction. Uh, so at that point, when these proofs break, there isn't really a way to ask the proof assistant for help. With traditional proof automation, it's just going to start over again from scratch every single time because it has no idea how things have changed or even that things have changed at all. So what I do in this thesis is build smarter proof automation that knows proofs change and that helps you fix these proofs as automatically as possible, a really an implementation of this missing help tactic. Uh, and this is called proof repair. Uh, so proof repair is uh, so-called because of its resemblance to program repair. Uh, so program repair in the world of software engineering will automatically fix bugs in your program. Uh, and proof repair automatically fixes broken proofs. Uh, but the way that proof repair is quite different from the way that program repair tools will often work. Uh, a lot of program repair tools will work by running tests uh, to check if a patch is correct, uh, or by running programs and looking at their outputs. Uh, or to find candidates that are almost patches, they might use fitness functions to evaluate how close they are. Uh, but we don't really have natural analogs of these things in the world of proof repair. And furthermore, we're in a pretty weird language. Uh, you know, proof engineers write proofs as these high-level proof scripts. These are really abstract. Uh, in fact, you know, really each of these tactics in these proof scripts uh, is, is like a search procedure for a term. So it's not really natural to use traditional program repair techniques uh, when these break to you know, suggest the next search procedure. On the other hand, we can look down at the terms that these proof scripts compile to, uh, but this language Galena of these proof terms is really unforgiving because of this rich type theory, even really small changes in these terms can produce terms that no longer even type check. But we actually turn out to be really lucky uh, because the unforgiving nature of this language actually ends up helping us. Uh, what it really means is it lets us work around two of the biggest challenges in program repair, having enough information to efficiently search our search space for a patch and knowing with certainty that the patch that we find is correct. Uh, the traditional program repair literature uh, recommends using additional information to get around these challenges, things like example patches or specifications. Uh, and in the world of proof repair, we're really lucky because thanks to the rich foundations of this calculus of inductive constructions, uh, these examples and specifications are rich and widely available. Uh, examples show up inside of the terms and specifications inside of the types. So I'll show you two kinds of proof repair uh, that take advantage of this information and certainty that we get out of this language. Uh, proof repair by example 
uh, will look for this information inside of example patched proofs, uh, like proofs that the library developer fixes in response to a change. And it will use that to find something that with certainty can fix other proofs broken by the same change, like broken proofs inside of the clients. Uh, proof repair across type equivalences will find that information in the difference between the old and new version of some change data type. And it will use that information to with certainty fix functions or proofs that were broken by that change. Uh, and importantly, both of these work over these low level proof terms in Galena, rather than these high level proof scripts, so that they can take advantage of that information and certainty. Uh, and they do this, as I'll show you, uh, using a combination of semantic differencing algorithms. So differencing algorithms that understand the meaning of this calculus of inductive constructions uh, and proof term transformations, uh, program transformations that operate over proof terms. The differencing algorithms will extract that information and the transformations will generalize and apply it to fix your proofs. Uh, so the key results from the thesis are the design of these differencing algorithms and proof term transformations, uh, their implementation inside of a cock plugin suite, uh, and case studies that show that this can help proof engineers on real repair scenarios. Uh, now these results uh, do hold for each of these different kinds of proof repair, uh, but before I show you them, it is worth noting quickly that there's quite a difference in maturity between the two uh, proof repair tools that I'll show you today. Uh, so this first one that implements proof repair by example, uh, I also implemented this as a prototype to show that proof repair was possible. Uh, so what that means is that, you know, not only does it handle just a narrow class of changes, uh, but it doesn't, it has only preliminary support for actually applying the patches that it finds uh, to fix your proofs. Uh, and, you know, additionally, the case studies that I ran uh, when I was evaluating this uh, only show retroactively that it could have saved work uh, relative to reference repairs on a few practical use cases. Uh, now, when I built this uh, proof repair across type equivalences, uh, I um, also added a number of technologies that really take this and make it uh, really practical. Uh, so that's how I get from uh, you know, just a few practical use cases to something that really helps proof repair or that helps proof engineers on real scenarios and showing this whole thesis. So I wanna start by talking about uh, proof repair by example. Uh, so I'm gonna motivate proof repair by example uh, by telling you a story uh, about a floating point library in COC uh, that, you know, just kind of uh, inspires this proof repair by example workflow. Uh, so the story starts in 2004, uh, so long before uh, proof repair, uh, when this uh, PhD student by the name of Julien Narbo wrote a long proof of a theorem inside of his library. Uh, details don't matter too much, but it succeeded uh, until 13 years later when suddenly it broke. Another uh, reason it broke is that the Cox standard, standard library. library. Oh, I'm echoing. Okay. Someone asking a question or? Not that I see. Okay. Uh, it should be random because I think everyone's muted and I don't see any questions. So okay. plow on and hope it doesn't happen again. All right. Yeah. So the Cox standard library changed. Uh, now, uh, the change inside of the standard library uh, was really simple. Uh, there were these two lines, uh, nat to real, pos to nat of n. Uh, and each of these was just kind of pulled out into a single function, pos to real of n. So a really simple change produces something that behaves the same way, uh, but this already broke a whole bunch of client proofs. And in fact, it even broke proofs inside of the Cox standard library. So the library developers had to go in and fix all of these one by one, and they didn't even succeed at fixing all of them. Uh, you know, here's a comment saying uh, that they just gave up on some of these proofs. Uh, so yet again, we have experts giving up in the face of change. Uh, now, among those experts was Julien, uh, which is why his proof broke. Uh, but you know, thankfully for Julien, this proof engineer by the name of Hugo came along uh, and fixed this, uh, you know, whole proof for him. Uh, but while we're all grateful for people like Hugo, uh, you know, in 2018, I was thinking, you know, maybe we shouldn't need Hugo. Uh, you know, maybe a tool could do Hugo's work for him uh, by going inside and looking at all of these patched proofs inside of the Cox Standard Library, viewing all of these as examples, uh, like, you know, this patch to this plus negative positive uh, lemma, which was fixed in response to this change. You know, maybe you could pass this in to a tool uh, and have it from that, you know, find something that gets you back and forth between versions of interreal in particular between any proof of nat to real pos to nat of n and any proof of pos to real of n. 
Uh, and this is something that you could use to fix other proofs broken by the same change, either by applying it with traditional proof automation uh, or maybe by adding it to a hint database so that Cock will apply it automatically and you don't even need to change your proof. Either way, getting kind of an automated version of Yugo. Uh, so, you know, this is what I eventually implemented inside of this Cock plugin suite. Uh, called Pumpkin Patch. Uh, now, Pumpkin Patch stands for this long and wonderful acronym, which is a free joke that Dan gave me for all six years of my PhD. So, thanks to Dan for this acronym. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I say it's a cock plugin suite. Um, at this point, it's about uh, three plugins as well as a cock plugin library um, implemented in about 15,000 lines of OCaml. Uh, obviously, with the help of some undergraduates, master's students uh, that I've mentored. Um, you know, all throughout. Uh, now, when I talk about proof repair by example, this refers to just one of these plugins, the initial, um, you know, prototype plugin that I implemented uh, that supports this class of changes. Uh, and what that plugin does is generalize a single example patch proof uh, into a reusable proof patch. Uh, are you asking a question? Hi. Oops. I've, I've muted the... Oh, thanks. Okay, yeah, generalize a single example of patch proof into a reusable proof patch. Uh, so uh, what happens here is you can pass in the old and new version of a proof that you fixed in response to a change. Uh, from that, you know, it will find a patch. It will check that patch, make sure that it's actually going to help you, and then send that back to you. And that patch is something you can use with traditional proof automation to fix other proofs broken by that same change. Uh, or but you can have it add this to a hint database in Cock, so that sometimes uh, it will just apply it automatically and you won't even need to fix your proof. Uh, now underneath this tool um, is a combination of semantic differencing algorithms and proof term transformations. Uh, so differencing here, we'll look at the difference between the old and new version of the example patch proof. And what it finds will be a list of patch candidates. Uh, so these are a number of proof terms uh, and they're kind of localized to the context of that example patch proof. Uh, they're not yet enough to fix other proofs broken by the same change. Uh, so that's where the transformations come in. The transformations will then take each one of these candidate proofs, which are proof terms, uh, and we'll try to transform them directly to a reusable patch. And that reusable patch is a proof that will actually help you fix other proofs broken by this change. Uh, so let's look quickly at an example. Uh, you know, let's say the old and new versions of the example patch proof are both inductive proofs about the natural numbers. Uh, because this language is so structured, we can sort of view these, you know, compile these down to things that look like trees. So let's say we had for all n p of n, and now we have for all n q of n. Uh, so the thing that we're proving has changed. Uh, well, uh, these are kind of structured the same way. Uh, so each of them has a base case, the zero case. Uh, and an inductive case. Uh, because of this, differencing knows exactly where to look. Uh, so let's say that it finds a candidate inside of the difference of base cases. What that really is, is a function that gets us back and forth between P and Q at zero. Uh, so that is our candidate, and it knows that it has actually found a candidate. Uh, now it also knows that the patch it's looking for should get us between P and Q more generally for any N. Uh, so that's where the transformations come in. And there are four of these inside of the proof repair by example plugin. Uh, now here, one called generalization will run because we have something that's kind of localized uh, to this base case. It's a function that shows, you know, that gets us between P and Q at zero, but we want something between P and Q for any N. So generalization will go in and try to um, abstract the occurrences of that zero uh, to, find some, to produce a function that gets us between P and Q more generally for any N. Uh, so that's, you know, how these transformations work um, at a high level. Uh, now, with this uh, design, we get a tool that, you know, really uh, could have helped proof engineers on real repair scenarios. Uh, so I showed retroactively uh, for this plugin uh, that for three large developments, the Comsert C compiler, uh, Software Foundation, and the Cox Standard Library, um, there are changes where the pumpkin patch uh, plugin uh, could have saved work for proof engineers. Um, you know, by fixing, fixing these proofs in response to changes. Uh, but, you know, this is our first reason to believe that I'll show you. Uh, but of course, you know, I promised more than this. Uh, you know, yet again, this is only uh, a prototype plugin at this point. 
Um, and I only show retroactively in just a few use cases that it could have been useful. Uh, so, you know, for this next plugin that I'll show you, um, it will add a number of technologies that take this, you know, from just sometimes useful to often in practical use cases. And at the same time, it will add support for a whole, you know, new class of changes. Uh, so this is uh, what the proof repair across type equivalences is. So what proof repair across type equivalences does uh, is automatically fix proofs in response to a broad class of changes in data types. So here's a really simple example I can think of. Uh, you know, one thing we can do is take our list data type, take these two constructors, nil and cons, and just kind of swap them. Really simple change, produces something that clearly behaves the same way as our original list, uh, but this can already break proofs that we wrote about it, like our proof of zip preserves length that we wrote earlier. Uh, now, uh, with this extension to pumpkin patch, uh, we can just pass in the old and new version of the data type that has changed, along with the old proof broken by the change. And now it will actually just fix our proof for us. Uh, so we can just use that new proof going forward. Uh, and it's not just you know, swapping constructors of a list that this can handle. Uh, this can actually support anything, any change that can be described by something called a type equivalence. Uh, so type equivalence is something from homotopy type theory. Uh, really all it is is a pair of functions that get us back and forth between uh, two versions of a type. Uh, so for old list and new list, we can write these functions swap and swap back. And you know these, these functions are mutual inverses. Uh, so if we take our old list, we swap the two constructors and then we swap them back, we get back the original list and similarly in the opposite direction. Uh, when we have two functions like this that get us back and forth between versions of our type, we can say those versions are equivalent to each other. Uh, and pumpkin patch, this extension to it for proof repair across type equivalences, it has a number of search procedures that given the old and new version of a data type will actually search for and prove these equivalences for you automatically. Uh, but when it doesn't have these search procedures, you can also just pass in this equivalence yourself. In either case, it will then use that equivalence to take your old function or proof broken by that change and repair it to some new function or proof defined over the new version of the data type. Uh, and it turns out these type equivalences are actually even more expressive than they may sound at first, you know, when you hear the word equivalence. Uh, so for example, they can handle adding some new information to your data types uh, sometimes. Uh, one example of this that I like uh, is adding certain indices to your data types. Uh, so this is a, a change that was prohibitively difficult for proof engineers to do by hand, uh, but there's a lot of automation that we support for this kind of change. So we can really uh, you know, automate these proofs that would have been too hard for proof engineers uh, to do to begin with. So really save work here. Uh, one example I like of this is going from lists uh, to length index vectors. Uh, so a length index vector is really just a list that carries its length at the type level. Uh, so what this lets proof engineers do is enforce length invariance at compile time. Uh, so it's a desirable change, but it's really hard to do by hand. Uh, now this proof repair across type equivalences can actually discover and prove an equivalence that corresponds to this change. But it's a little bit of a weird equivalence. Uh, it actually, it's not an equivalence between lists and vectors. It's an equivalence between lists at a particular length and vectors. So it has to carry this additional information, this kind of length invariant. What this means for the proof engineer uh, is that, you know, we can get you from your functions and proofs over lists to functions and proofs over vectors, as long as you actually show us that you've chosen a length that is okay. So you have to pass in this additional information, this length invariant yourself. Uh, so that's one of many case studies uh, that I'll show you, uh, you know, a little bit later on. Uh, but all of this is implemented inside of an extension to this pumpkin patch plugin suite. Uh, and I wanna show you what that's like, you know, a little bit in action. So I'll show you an example where we change a data type and then break the whole Cox standard library. Uh, and then we're going to use pumpkin patch to automatically fix all 451 broken functions and proofs in about 25 seconds. I uh, know the change I show you here will just be this simple example where we just kind of swap the constructors of list. What we'll then do is call this uh, repair module command, which is really this help tactic inside of pumpkin patch for these equivalences. We'll pass it the old and new version of the data type and tell it to fix our standard library. Uh, so let's take a look at that. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is step down to the bottom of the library and just show that everything works before the change. So that's what I'm doing now. And then once that turns green, then everything works. Then I'm gonna step back up and I'm actually going to change our list data type. And then I'll step back down to the bottom again. Uh, so I'm changing list. 
When I step back down to the bottom, you'll see a whole bunch of things break. Uh, so everything that breaks here will turn red. And everything that turns red now is something that we would have to fix by hand if we didn't have a tool. Uh, but with pumpkin patch now, we can just update our list data type, pass in some optimizations, and then call this repair module command. And what you see it doing on the right is actually producing new versions of all our functions, all our proofs for us, uh, updating the entire library. Uh, if you look in the bottom right corner, there's this little blue bar. Uh, that just means that it's still kind of running the tool. It takes about 25 seconds, and then you'll see it turn green. And when it turns green, the entire library will be updated. Uh, so wait a couple more seconds, and it's done. Uh, so that's what it's like you know, to use, to use this at scale uh, to fix a proof development. Uh, now, if you were looking closely, uh, you might have realized that uh, you know, this will actually give you back not proof terms, but oh, proof can terms. I yeah? interrupt with a question? Sure. Um, yeah. You know, and I don't do a lot, you know, a live made up demo or anything, but just some intuition on um, what it looks like after 25 seconds if it doesn't work, right? Yeah. Like, you know, right? Is it, you know, is it, I, I get the sense on some level, it is a magic box that does magical things. And if it doesn't, sorry, you know, it's not that it's not sort of like, here's 80% of, you know, or does it do 80% of the library, and then you just do 20% the old fashioned way, what's kind of the, the work? Yeah. Yeah. It depends on the failure mode, I guess. So, um, I mean, yeah, so the, the theory, it's in the like, at, at the theory level, it's guaranteed to, to fix everything. Um, at the implementation level, of course, there are bugs, like I'm human. Um, so and I, I haven't verified, you know, the implementation, um, when there are bugs, uh, what will happen is, um, well, if, and, sorry, not just yeah. bugs, but also heuristics and solving undecidable problems, right? Like, there's, you know. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. There, there's. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah. Let's see. Um, so there. So when it's undecidable, um, so one one thing that might happen is that it might not be able to identify um, like all the possible things that it should be porting. Um, when that happens, there's a way to kind of add annotations yourself uh, to guide the tool. Um, in the meantime, what it will do um, is just kind of, so it'll, if it fails on some function, it will just give you a little bit of an error message, um, but it won't uh, break the whole library. It continues to port the rest of the library. It'll just say like, I failed to port this function. Uh, now, you know, if one of them breaks and a lot of things depend on it, then things that depend on it might also, you know, break because it doesn't have the updated version. Um, so that's the same kind of thing that happens for bugs. I put a lot of work into uh, usable error messages, though, because of the uh, this partnership with an industrial proof engineer. Uh, so yeah, who just really needed, you know, feedback. So it'll actually suggest to you like um, things that you can do to try to work around what's broken and so on. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. OK. Uh, yeah, so um, if you were looking closely, uh, you might have realized that this will actually give you back uh, these proof scripts in the end. Uh, and you know, this is thanks to an undergraduate render that I worked with uh, who actually wrote a decompiler getting from these low-level proof terms uh, back up to proof scripts. Uh, so, you know, because of this, the proof engineer in the end can get these proof scripts, uh, but the transformations and differencing algorithms uh, can all focus on these low-level proof terms that give it all this information and certainty. Uh, so this is how, you know, able to implement these differencing algorithms and transformations over these terms, but give you back useful, you know, proof scripts. Uh, now, differencing here, uh, we'll look at the difference between the old and new version of the change data type. Uh, and what it will find here is actually this type equivalence. Uh, you know, the proof, the functions that go back and forth and the proof that it forms an equivalence. Of course, that's in the case that we have search procedures. Uh, otherwise, if you supply the equivalence yourself, you kind of are doing the differencing for pumpkin patch here. In either case, it will then uh, run a transformation to get from the old proof term directly to a new proof term defined over the new data type. And that transformation will essentially lift across the equivalence. Uh, so for example, if we have our old zip function over our old list data type, we swap the cases and we wanna get to some new zip function. 
we really want is for equivalent inputs to go to equivalent outputs. Uh, so if we take our inputs to our new zip function, revert them back across the equivalents, call our old zip, and update the result back, uh, that would give us the same result as just calling our new zip function to begin with. That's what it's like for functions. More generally, it implements something from homotopy type theory called transport. Uh, and if you don't know homotopy type theory, you can kind of just think of this as rewriting across equivalences, not just for functions, but also for proofs. Uh, but there's a little bit of a twist to you know, how I actually implement this, uh, because I implement transport as a proof term transformation. Uh, this is a little strange, because the way that transport typically works is actually by explicitly rewriting across these equivalences, calling these conversion functions at runtime every single time. Uh, so this gives us a large large proofs, it gives us uh, slow functions, but furthermore, you know, it makes repair impossible because we have to keep around the old version of the data type, our old functions and proofs after every incremental change. Uh, so instead I implement this as a proof term transformation. I have a transformation that will run just once and get you, you know, from the thing defined over the old data type directly to the thing defined over the new data type, but in a way that behaves like transport. Uh, so this way I get uh, small proof terms, fast functions. These numbers are just for one class of changes that I looked at relative to traditional transport. Uh, but furthermore, this makes repair actually possible because we can get rid of the old versions of our functions of our old uh, data types after these changes. Uh, so there's some really fun type theory that makes this possible. Uh, in particular, I actually have to deconstruct these equivalences into things that just talk about the old data type and things that just talk about the new data type. Uh, there's this theorem inside of category theory called Lambex theorem uh, that lets me do this. Uh, so, you know, for example, uh, let's say I have this old list data type, I've you know, swapped the constructors and I get this new list data type. Uh, what I can do is kind of take any equivalence between these and kind of pull it apart into things that just talk about our old list, like how to construct the old list with this nil and cons constructor, uh, and just talk about the new version of the list. Uh, because these have the same shape, we haven't added any new constructors or anything like this. Uh, it can actually, in a pretty straightforward way, uh, map between the constructors of each of these lists. Uh, and we can do this just by kind of replacing them uh, without ever calling the functions that get us back and forth. Uh, so that's how we can implement a proof term transformation for this. Uh, but that was a really easy case uh, because there I didn't change the shape of the data type at all. I didn't add any new constructors or anything like this. Uh, it gets much harder when we change shape uh, because Koch has this thing called definitional equality uh, and that breaks when we change shape. Uh, so definitional equality and Koch, uh, two things are definitionally equal if they reduce to the same normal form. Uh, this is in contrast with propositional equality where two things are propositionally equal if you can prove that they're equal to each other. Uh, so here the type checker will kind of prove it for you. Uh, but changes in shape will uh, make things that used to reduce uh, no longer reduce sometimes. Uh, so one example where this shows up is a classic benchmark in the proof engineering community uh, going between unary and binary natural numbers. Uh, so this actually used to be, there used to be an entire tool back in 2000 describing, you know, just implementing how to get from unary uh, to binary and back, uh, no other kinds of changes. Uh, but this actually fits into this proof term transformation uh, just with a little bit of cleverness, because now the shape is changing. There are many more, you know, different kinds of constructors uh, for binary uh, than for unary. So we can't just kind of naively substitute constructors of unary um, with constructors of binary. Uh, if we do that, then things that used to reduce uh, will no longer reduce automatically. Uh, but we can actually map between these. We just need to be a little clever. Uh, we need to actually reify a proof that's usually really implicit when we're just looking at this diagram, which is actually the proof that this whole thing commutes. Uh, so in particular, what that amounts to is reifying uh, and transforming uh, definitional equalities, these reduction rules, directly to propositional equalities, uh, proofs that they're actually equal to each other. Uh, and you know, this is where a lot of this really fun type theory comes in. Um, so I really recommend reading the thesis if you want to know all the details of this. Uh, but you know, this is kind of the trick that makes this possible for any equivalence. Uh, now, because of this, we get something that's practical and useful for proof engineers on real scenarios. Uh, and I've shown you two case studies already. Uh, I also support a number of uh, benchmarks from the user study that I ran, um, as well as some external examples uh, from experts in the community. Uh, and you know, probably my favorite of these uh, is this partnership that I had with an industrial user. 
Uh, and this partnership, uh, this use case is maybe like a little bit weird, uh, but it really shows off the flexibility of this kind of repair tool. Uh, this is sort of what I like to call mixed methods verification. Uh, this proof engineer is a proof engineer at Galois, and he was writing proofs about an implementation of the TLS handshake protocol. Uh, and he wanted to write these proofs mostly by interacting in familiar ways uh, with a tool that called out to constraint solvers. Uh, but sometimes those constraint solvers would get stuck. So when that happened, he wanted to give just a little bit of guidance to the COG proof assistant to sort of finish off those proofs. Uh, and using uh, this uh, pumpkin patch repair tool, I was actually able to help build a layer of automation in between that let him get this workflow. Uh, so kind of a non-standard use case, but really shows off the flexibility, you know, and how we can get something useful from this. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can find all of these uh, inside of the thesis, inside of the repository. Um, you can see exactly, you know, how, which ones we saved a lot of work on, which ones were a little more challenging, need more automation still. Uh, but, you know, all of this uh, is what shows that this thesis uh, really holds on practical use cases. Uh, so at this point, you know, you really do have reason to believe, uh, and not just sometimes anymore, uh, you know, often in practical use cases. Uh, now, you know, importantly, it's not just uh, me that believes this at this point, uh, you know, so here's a really recent article uh, by a proof engineer, uh, just, you know, kind of saying the same thing, saying proof should repair themselves. And he said, we have reason to think that proof repair is tractable. You know, we're not starting from scratch. Uh, that would be too difficult. We're starting from a proof of something similar and attempting proof reconstruction within a known neighborhood. Uh, so, you know, kind of given other people a reason to believe. Uh, and, you know, he credits this work here. Uh, but of course, you know, he also says we need more people working on this. Uh, naturally, I agree. Uh, so if you check out the thesis, you'll see a lot of the, uh, you know, the limitations right now of the current repair tools, what we can do to make them better. Uh, but also, you know, taking this a little bit further, um, how we can go from proof repair uh, to a world of proof engineering for all. Uh, really a world where engineers of all skill levels across all domains will be able to develop and maintain these verified systems. Uh, so if you read the thesis, you'll see, you know, how we can take this from not just helping experts, uh, but to also helping practitioners like proof engineers in industry, uh, software engineers who have never used one of these proof assistants before, uh, and people in entirely new domains. Uh, so I recommend reading that, uh, you know, if you're interested in how we can build a world of much more robust and secure software systems. Uh, but, you know, I want to, yeah, uh, I just, I want to thank everyone who has uh, worked with me on all this work. Um, so in the, rectangle here are all the people who have worked with me on the proof repair work. Uh, and then around that, people who have uh, helped me out with other, or worked with me on other proof engineering work. Uh, now, if you read the thesis, there's a really long acknowledgement section. These pictures are totally non-exhaustive, uh, but just some of the people and one of the dogs uh, that has made the last six years, like just so much fun. Um, <laughs> but thank you everyone. Um, you know, I just hope today that I've given you some reason to believe, uh, and I hope you want to join me in building this world of uh, proof engineering for all. Thanks. All right. Uh, I, I have unmuted and clapped. You're welcome to. There's various reaction signs. Um, <laughs> if you do unmute, remember to remute in a minute. Um, you all were shockingly quiet during the talk. We will never know whether it was the uh, Zoom format or Talia's exposition. Uh, but nonetheless, I do hope we have time for questions or discussions. Uh, you can put your question in the chat. You can raise your hand. You can unmute. I can, I can handle it all. We've been living on Zoom for 15 months. However you want to do it, uh, go for it. Um, <laughs> So far, the, the comments, the, the chat comments are not questions. They are uh, congratulatory, uh, which is <laughs> uh, welcome. Um, I, I guess I can get us restarted with, with a second question of sort of, you know, um, don't freak. I, I'm going to frame this question in a humorous way. Don't freak out, right? Which is like, suppose your advisor came to you and said, you know, you've done two really good ones here. You did proof by example, you did proof across type equivalences. I wanna see one more. Like, I wanna see one more that has a practical use case that has, 
you know, something that can do it. It's not going to solve every proof of parent cock. Like sort of what's next on your list, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think the um, probably the most the most immediate gains uh, that are really tractable, I think, would be going from equivalences to more arbitrary relations. Um, this just supports a larger class of use cases. Um, there's a recent paper at Popple that showed like um, there's a class of use cases that inside of COC I wouldn't be able to express with just equivalences, but I could express if I had you know better relations. Uh, so um, the kind of transformation approach uh, in theory is something that you can uh, use for these more arbitrary relations. It would also get us some practical gains, uh, even on some of the equivalences, like some of the things I expressed as equivalences were not quite natural to express that way. So in some of those cases, it wouldn't save work for the proof engineer yet, like adding new constructors to inductive types. You can like stuff it into an equivalence, but it's just not really natural to do that. Uh, so it's still hard for people to use that way. Uh, so yeah, by supporting arbitrary relations, I think this would this would really help out. And um, there's a pretty practical way to do this, I think. Sounds good. Um, there's about four questions in the chat, which you I can read them out to you or you can look at. Um, but there's also hands from Val and now uh, Tej. So, um, you know, I don't know, like, I'm just gonna let's go to Val and then the chat questions and then back. So. Okay. All right, so my question is a little open-ended, but I was just wondering if you had any ideas on how to tackle uh, sort of like make uh, sort of like you know when you when you have a huge term, there might be places in the term that are just completely pointless to even try to repair because they're just not relevant, and it seems like yeah, tools often like spend a lot of time doing like trying to see if there's work to be done somewhere that actually doesn't need to be done. Do you have any? Any ideas or any thoughts about like how to get like how to avoid such problems and like how to get better performance out of repair? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so right now um, this is pretty manual. Like you can tell it, uh, you know, I don't want you to visit this term. Uh, there's like an option that you can pass in that's like don't dive in there uh, because that would not be um, actually helpful at all. Um, and there is a lot of caching that's implemented where like if it tries something and nothing changed, then it will um, automatically use, well, actually, regardless of whether something changed, it knows that it can go in and use uh, what it's already calculated. Um, I think much harder is kind of automatically detecting what it shouldn't go into at all. I think you could do some kind of maybe like a dependency analysis. I don't know if it would be faster. It probably would be faster. You could do some kind of dependency analysis to see if it actually like refers to those data types. Uh, that you've changed uh, ahead of time and then use that to set things uh, as what's called opaque so that it doesn't, it, opaque to the tool so that it doesn't actually dive in and, and try to port those. Cool. It might help you if I just read because there's a bunch in the chat if you don't. Yeah, that's that's that. really so, helpful to me. Yeah, yeah no, no worries. So Lars asks, um, if you're familiar with the lifting transfer tool in Isabel, can you draw a quick comparison? Yeah. Yeah, I thought about this a lot. So there's actually, I, I outlined in the thesis, like how to implement repair using transfer, I think. Uh, so let's see, the one thing about, um, well, there, there are many differences between Isabel and Cock, which makes it a little bit confusing. Um, so transfer in Isabel, um, it, uh, so Isabel doesn't even have these things called proof terms, which is a little, makes things a little bit different. Uh, but if it did have proof terms, the way that transfer works, would still um, actually refer to the old thing. It would kind of do this conversion back and forth. Um, so you could, um, and then of course, if you're applying transfer, you're still going to be referring to the old data type when you call it. Uh, so what that means is that you're not going to be able to remove your old data type and use it for repair uh, naturally. Uh, but I think there is a way to actually uh, extend it to support this. I think what you could do is um, kind of use a really, uh, so you can maybe like reify, um, so there's like Isabel like whole proofs, you could reify those proof terms with whole proofs um, with running, running transfer and then try to find a way to produce back, you know, or I guess not running transfer itself, you could make a transformation based on, on transfer, much like the transformation inside of pumpkin pie, and then you could, you know, or pumpkin patch, uh, and then you could actually port that back up to automation in the end. Um, I'm a much better writer than I am at talking. So uh, if you look at the paragraph inside of the, uh, of the thesis about that, it, 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 yeah, it has a nice path for that, which I'm pretty excited about. Mm -hmm.
Okay, uh, next up from David Moon, what are some trends you noticed in the case study of program repairs that were difficult to automate? Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think adding adding constructors is one where like, um, where it was still struggling a lot. And it's, it's also a really common one. Uh, when I did this, uh, this user study, um, people would uh, like just very often, like people would rarely define an inductive type ahead of time and then just use it in their proofs. Um, much more often they would like define uh, um, just like kind of a, a sketch of an inductive type, start it off, go back down, write some proofs, go back up, extend it and continue with this kind of workflow. Um, this is really common. And I, you know, I supported this a little bit with this tool right now, uh, but it still really struggled because I really had to like, like force it into an equivalence. Um, I was like proud of myself that I could force it into an equivalence, but then when I actually tried to, uh, you know, repair the functions and repair the proofs, um, it was much harder than doing it manually still for that class of changes. <laughs> um, so this is a part where, um, either using these arbitrary relations uh, or working on some, uh, there's there are actually a couple papers on, on proof reuse, extending inductive types, uh, just not any tools built on them that, that might help out there. Uh, that would really help. Great, and one more from the chat, uh, Mario Alvarez. Uh, awesome talk question, how should we approach proof repair in languages that don't have proof terms like Isabella? <laughs> yeah, I really, I think, I think, yeah, I think reifying proof terms is, is the way to go there that I, or at least the, the, the path of least resistance, like given that I've implemented this over proof terms. If you have a rich enough uh, language of automation, then in theory, you could repair the automation. Um, Val's thesis <laughs> actually talks about why this is hard. Um, um, good, okay, over to uh, Tej. Talia, so I mostly work on proofs of imperative programs in sort of a sub language embedded in Coq. Um, so I'm still doing proofs in Coq, but it's kind of like maybe in sort of a custom theory, right? There's like a horologic built into Coq. Um, so I'm wondering to what ex like do you do you think it makes sense to rebuild these tools for what is almost a different language, or like do you think that it makes sense to do these proofs at the level of um, still CIC? Um, but I'm just wondering what you think of like changes to imperative programs as opposed to these like shallow Galena terms. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I'm not, I'm not sure if I've tried a, a use case like that. So I think it'd be really interesting to try. Um, I think, uh, so I mean, a lot of times when you're implementing languages, I don't know how it's implemented, but if you, if you have things defined like inductively, like the case where, um, where, well, that was a change in the language. Yeah, change in the actual terms. Um, I don't. I don't think I actually know. You know, quite the answer to that yet. I know where I would start uh, if I wanted to find out the answer, <laughs> um, okay. which is I would pick that development. I would take a look at it. Um, I would, you know, look at some historical changes that people have made. Take a look at the proof terms. Uh, see, you know, how straightforward it is to get from one of these proof terms to the other, um, and then think about, you know. Is there something corresponding to the language itself that describes that? I think I, I also want to build in at some point support for like custom changes. Uh, and that might be a place where, I mean, right now there's support for custom changes if you're like an OCaml expert <laughs> and can actually go in and modify the plugin. But I want to make it so that you could actually just easily extend it. And then, and then I think you could build in kind of custom repair automation for your developments, mm -hmm. for your domain. Great. Cool. Uh, Thanks. Over to Jason. Great presentation, Talia. Um, so the context that I'm coming from is that I build a lot of tactic automation. Uh, and I know you said that your tool can output proof scripts, but it looked like it outputs fairly level, low level ones. Uh, and I'm wondering about the possibility of um, like, so often I, I want to continue using my automation because I'll have similar goals in the future and I want to keep using the same sort of automation to prove more goals. And so if I tweak something, I don't want just the like, let's now replace this high powered automation with this low level automatically generated proof script. I want to know, okay, here's how you fix this bit of the automation. Um, 
And like sometimes the problems come from, well, Cox's uh, algorithm for which goals it shells after this tactic changed. And that's the thing that broke the automation. So it's not even a data structure change. And I'm wondering if you have any like thoughts or plans for supporting this sort of use. Yeah. Yeah. So there, I guess there are two different kinds of things there. Um, if the broken automation is still just from like a change in data type, um, but uh, you know, you want back proofs that are actually going to use your own tactics and not just these kind of naive, like, you know, decompiled ones, machine learning, <laughs> um, like actually though. Uh, so there's a, this is something that I'm working on right now, which I'm really excited about, um, which is like the decompiler, um, you know, currently is just kind of naively defined. It's like trans translating these terms directly to like predefined tactics. You can pass in hints yourself. So you can say, I want you to use these tactics. Uh, these can be your own tactics and it will try to replace those as it's decompiling. But uh, what I want to do and what I'm working on now, uh, just kind of just started, is in integrating a machine learning proof synthesis tool uh, called TacTalk um, to actually help this decompiler like really, you know, use the tactics that a human would use. First, it will just be like any human. So it's going to be ranking these hints to, uh, you know, re replace them. And then I think later on, like the particular human, like matching your style using your own custom tactics would be really cool. That's a lot harder, but um, it's, it's on the, you know, the path that I'm excited about. Uh, now, when the actual tactics are changing and it's not the terms breaking, then I think the, uh, the approaches in the, uh, um, in this thesis are not directly applicable. Like that's a place where you would need some kind of new, new development and I'm not quite sure how to do it yet. Mm. So it sounds like the, the style of automation that would be most compatible with this is having uh, sort of lots of little helper tactics that you uh, just sort of all call at top level so that if some of them fail, you can still make use of the other ones uh, rather than having like a deeply nested pipeline of tactics where if something in the middle of the pipeline fails, then you have to throw out the whole pipeline. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, there's another thing I didn't talk about there, which is like actually repairing the implementation of the tactic. Um, and that one is not going to be solved by this. Uh, that's, um, but it's something I'm interested in. I think, I think that the, at that point you need to get from us. I mean, there's like a similar workflow. I've watched people, like I've watched, I've watched Adam, for example, uh, repair his tactics after making changes. And I think it follows a really similar workflow to the way that people will fix proofs. Often he will actually fix a proof first <laughs> uh, and then go in and extract that uh, to something more general to fix his tactic. Uh, so I, I think you could maybe build that into a tool too. You know, if I'm already fixing mm -hmm. the proof, maybe there's some kind of uh, like insight that I can extract into fixing the tactic. But yeah, it definitely requires like more work there. It's not a not something I've immediately done. Yeah, I, I imagine. Uh, and feel free to tell me to shut up and let other people ask questions. Um, but I imagine the way, like one thing that might be useful here is that uh, when when I try to debug what's broken with tactic scripts, I, I uh, set the uh, LTAC debugging and print out the like enormous backtrace, the couple million lines of like all the goals and tactics. And I just look at a diff of like, where did it, like where did something change in the, in the thing I was trying to prove? And so I imagine that maybe combining that with how to fix the, uh, the proof term would be like, oh, when you like, here's the like tactic stuff where the proof went wrong, so now you can insert this alternative at that tactic step, um, and that would yeah. let you fix things. Yeah, that sounds cool. Yeah, if you send me, if you have any commits where you've done this kind of thing too, it'd be it'd be interesting to look back at. I I can send you one. I don't know how helpful it would be given that it was the the strongest example of this in my mind is when Fox uh, algorithm for what goals to shelf changed, and so I just had to change the parenthetization and brackets around a single tactic in the middle of like some deeply nested thing. But yeah, I can send you that. Cool, yeah. And there's one more in the chat now. It refers to an earlier question. We may need to reestablish some context uh, from Christoph uh, following up on the adding inductive cases thing, but it makes sense to have a repair strategy that tries to add cases to proofs by analogy to previously proved cases. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've thought about this. Um, yeah, like using using kind of example the the example based approach, but uh, instead of looking at um, 
instead of looking at how to find a function, like looking at how, you know, what you could generalize that case to. Um, I looked at a couple examples of, of changed terms to see how useful they were. Um, and I think I, I didn't immediately, like the structure that I was looking for didn't immediately pop out to okay. me, so I wasn't positive, but sorry, is someone sorry, talking? Uh, uh, yeah, I, yeah. The, it's, it's me. I, I just had to unmute <laughs> for interactivity's sake. Uh, am, I, am I heard? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, no, because the, because what I was, what I was thinking, because the example that was sitting in my head when I asked that question was like, let's say you're defining, you know, you're like defining like some language or something and maybe you've added a U operator and the proof of a bunch of theorems for that operator is good. It's like, it's another arithmetic operator or something. And the proof is mostly the same as a thing you already did for a different one. Yeah. And there might be, there might be something you could leverage there for repair purposes. I don't know how much sense it makes, but yeah. Yeah. That's I think kind of, that was sort of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I think you could do this um, using, using an example based approach to kind of infer what that extra case might look like. Uh, but I don't think it would always work. Uh, sometimes, sometimes. Oh no, no, I, cases, yeah, it's it's. it's I don't think it would always yeah. work either. I just think it's something that where you could, I guess, you could sort of try analogy. I guess what I'm thinking is like try analogy. No, yeah. this is it. I think this is exactly it, right? This is what paper and pencil proofs do, right? They do a case, and then for another case, they say by analogy to that previous case, right? And in Coq, there are engineering approaches to this, right? But you don't get to do it that way. Right, you have to abstract it to a lemma and then invoke that lemma twice, and you might later refactor it. Um, but as from an engineering workflow, I think there's some appeal to at least as a temporary measure allowing the paper and pencil approach uh, with the sort of guarantee that it produced a proof term that, that checks. And um, it's not quite repair in the maintenance sense of your thesis statement, Talia, but I think. It does, it does strike me as somewhat similar technology. Yeah, it, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, and I think also the, uh, this also shows up, I, yeah, I think about the analogy to paper proofs a lot. Like there's a, similarly in the opposite direction is like one of my favorites in, in human yeah. proofs. Yeah. Uh, and this actually shows up as one of the transformations that I've implemented this uh, um, inversion uh, can actually, you could call this as a tactic if you want and be like, it, right now it's just like invert, but it could be like, you know, s similarly in the opposite direction or something. And it would, it'll actually like, it does a lot with the, what the human does, honestly. Like you, when you actually think about when you're reading a proof as a similarly opposite direction, you're like kind of looking for things to, to swap in like strategic ways. Uh, these actually end up exploiting like symmetry properties. Uh, so this is actually what the, what the uh, automation does too, which is kind of cool, but yeah. <laughs> Humans and machines are not that different. Oh, that's pretty cool, actually. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other questions at the moment. I can give the shy a few seconds to change their mind, but more likely, I think we've had a good discussion and, oh, all right, one more. What are what are you most excited about for Urbana Champagne? <laughs> oh man, <laughs> but like in general, or <laughs> I I just read the question. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I'm I'm just excited to, to be a professor. Like I I want to have students. It's, it's gonna be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Good. All right. Um, on that uh, totally appropriate but uh, lighter note, uh, there's been lots of congratulatory comments. Thanks, thank you for the good presentation. Don't leave Talia, don't leave Zach, don't leave Max, don't leave Roz, um, everyone else, uh, and I mean this in the nicest ways possible. Um, please leave. And I think uh, I just need to get a couple people. I think I can just 
remove the last couple. Uh, if, if, once I remove them, they can't join again. I think that's fine. Um, I don't have to keep removing them. Okay, here we are. Great job. Um,